Hey everyone, in today's video, I want to walk you through an example model lesson that I recently did with a first grade classroom. Now, just last week, I uploaded this video right here where I went through four of my top interview tips and I made them for teaching interviews in general, but they definitely have an elementary focus. So today for the model lesson that I'm gonna walk through, this is actually a first grade math lesson. So not only am I going to share with you the exact lesson that I used and all the materials, which I will pass over to you for free, but also if you happen to be teaching about numbers within 120, this lesson's gonna be great for you too. So all those freebies are coming up. If you're ready to see this lesson, give this video a like, subscribe to my channel, and let's just dive in. to do a model lesson, that means you likely nailed your teacher interview and they wanna see what you're actually like in the classroom. This is a great time to really let your personality show, show how much you love working with children and also a little bit of your pedagogy. They want to see how you're going to give a lesson. Now, before I show you the exact lesson that I taught, there are a few tips that I thought I should share first. So first and foremost, if you're asked to do a model lesson, you need to know the parameters. You want to know what grade level are you teaching? Do they have a specific subject or standard they want you to teach? Oftentimes when I have been asked to do a model lesson in the past, I have been told exactly what standard I'm going to teach to. So I've done a few ones for literacy way back when. And then for this lesson specifically, the math coordinator actually reached out and she told me that I would be teaching a first grade lesson on numbers within 120. She also gave me some background information that they had already been taught how to compare numbers within 120. Um, so we were kind of doing comparing, ordering, and students would be using their place value knowledge. It's also, you know, the end of the year. So knowing what I know about first grade students and what has been taught, I had a pretty good idea of what students were able to do. Now, of course, this is going to be a review lesson. We're not going to be teaching something brand new. So I was able to kind of go from there. If you don't have all that information, it is totally fine to ask for some of it. Like I said, you wanna know what grade level are you teaching? What standard are you teaching them? How many students are in the class? Uh, just be aware that while they'll definitely answer, you know, what grade level and how many students there are so you're prepared, some schools don't give an exact standard. They just want you to come up with something grade appropriate. So you may want to look at a, you know, scope and sequence if you aren't familiar with that grade level and figure out something that, again, is going to be a review lesson that you're not necessarily teaching them brand new content. Another important thing to know is if you have access to technology. At the school I just did my lesson in, they have a smart board, so I made digital slides to go along with the lessons, and I made a lesson that was very, very indicative of what I would do in the classroom. I set it up from beginning to end exactly how I would teach my students this skill. Now a side note about the technology, make sure that if you do create slides, make the lesson not reliant on the slides. So have backup, if there was something you're going to show, make sure you have it in physical copy, just in case things go wrong, you don't want to rely on that technology. But I was able to use slides and in the free lesson I'm gonna share with you today, you'll also have access to all of the slides. All right, so I'll have a few other tips after, but let me just walk through the lesson so you can see exactly how I planned it. All right, so there were three main components to the lesson that I was teaching. I actually wrote out a complete lesson plan. I had the digital slides and then I had all of the principles that would be used during the lesson. So here's just an example of the overall lesson plan, just so you can see. So model lesson, comparing and ordering numbers to 120. I said our objective is we will use our place value knowledge to compare and order numbers within 120. For the warm up, we are going to do a math talk. That is how I kick off all of my math lessons. So I definitely wanted to start with that. And then we essentially go into the I do, we do, you do part of the lesson. So for this, we have explicit teaching where the teacher will show students how to use place value knowledge to compare and order numbers. Then I had a partner practice game and then we have independent practice. Now you'll see here, it's kind of bolded down there, but I said that this part of the lesson is going to be skipped for the model lesson because I only had a 30 minute time period. And then we have a quick wrap up. So that is definitely another thing you'll want to ask about. You want to know how long your lesson is going to be to make sure that you plan enough and not too much for that lesson. So I knew mine was 30 minutes, but to hit all the parts I wanted to hit, uh, I wanted to still plan a full lesson. And then I just took out that independent practice and I still brought copies for everybody. 
um, so that the teacher could do them if they wanted to after I left. I should also note that I printed out the lesson plan and all the printables and I stapled it together for all of the teachers that were going to be in the room during the modeled lesson, which for me, they were actually one, two, three, four, five, there were actually six teachers in the room watching. So I printed out that little packet just so they could follow along and see what was going on. I was lucky enough to actually know many of the students in the class because I had subbed in that classroom before. So I was already able to know students' names. If you wanted to have them fill out a name tag, you could, but I do caution you on that because you only have 30 minutes. And so instead, if you were calling on students, you may want to ask them their name before they give their answer and then really try to remember it so you can call on that student again and just show that you're really trying to pay attention to you know making connections and learning their names. So once I got in there, we just dove right in. Here are what my slides looked like. I just had this little math slide here so that it was displayed when I got in the classroom. And then we went to our math talk. So here we have let's compare and I have the words more or less down at the bottom and as you can see we have different values shown in place value blocks. So I told the class thank you so much for having me here today. We are going to do a fun math lesson but before we dive in I really want to warm up our brains. So we're going to talk about some math. And then when I showed this slide, I said, we have two words here on the bottom and I pointed to each one and I had the students say the word aloud. And then I asked, who can use these words more or less to compare the numbers shown in these boxes? We have three different numbers here. So who can use the words more or less to compare them? And then a bunch of students raised their hand. I called on a bunch of them to hear different answers. We talked about if we agree, do we disagree, who can restate what somebody said. All of the good math talk I talk about here in this video. But again, a math talk is something I feel very comfortable and confident doing. I wouldn't use your modeled lesson time to really try out you know, new things that you don't really know how to do just yet. This is not the time to do that. That is when you actually get the job. You can try those things out. Right now you are trying to impress and show again your connection with students as well as some of your pedagogy. Then we went to this slide right here, which we again have the same thing, but instead of place value blocks, we have numerals. And I even pointed out, wait a second, I see a lot of the same number here. I see a lot of ones, I see a lot of fives. When students would give me an answer comparing these numbers, I would ask them how they knew. So for instance, if one of my students said, oh, 15 is less than 51, I would be like, how do you know that? They both have a one and they both have a five. And they would just explain a little bit more. And then I went to this one right here, which is fill in the blanks. You can see 109 is less than blank, and students had to come up with different answers that could go there. And then 27 is greater than blank, and again, students had to come up with different answers. The entire math talk portion took about five, six minutes, which is just how long it would take normally in my classroom. Then I had our explicit teaching slide. We can use our place value knowledge to compare and order numbers. So I read that aloud to students and I explained that that is exactly what we are going to do today. And then I just kind of walked them through how I would compare these numbers. We have 111, 117. I talked about how they both have a one in the hundreds place and they both have a one in the tens place. So I need to go down to the ones place to compare them. I talked about how we have the visual representation here of these base 10 blocks and so on. The next slide was another explicit teaching, but I actually only completed the first problem here, 84 blank 63, where we had to do greater than or less than. And I actually just asked students to show me with their hands which way it was going to go. It was very clear by their math talk and by how quickly they were answering these questions that they understood the topic. And I didn't want to waste too much time going through the rest of it, of me just sitting there and talking to them, right? I didn't want my kids to get too antsy, so I wanted us to move on. So I was like, I think you guys get this let's get ready for some partner practice. So this is what that slide looks like, the let's practice together, because the game we are going to play has three different steps, so I wanted some visual directions. But then I also had students all come back to the rug and sit in a circle. For this point in time, they had all been sitting at their desks for the math talk and explicit teaching, so I knew I needed to get them up. And to really show how to play the game, I always have my students sit in a circle where they can see me play it, and I actually play it with a partner. So there were three parts to this game. I had a brown paper bag and it had a bunch of numbers within 120 inside there. And step one was that each of the partners was going to pull a card. So they would pull two cards total. We talked about that and I showed them how there are two cards on the bag. Then they each had place value boards. They had 100 tens in ones chart and they had a bag full of base 10 blocks. They had to each build the number that they pulled. 
Once they would pull the number, build the number, the last thing they would do is compare the number. And here is a close up of what that practice sheet actually looked like. So each student would write their own number in the box. I explicitly told them this. So they would each write their own number in the box and then they had to talk together to determine which one was bigger and which one was smaller and see how they would draw that sign, the greater than or less than sign. And then they would keep the cards out and pull two more. So each time they would pull two cards, they would each build their number, and then they would compare it and write it down on the recording sheet. Now, a few notes for this section. I already knew that students had a hundreds, tens, and ones chart, and I knew that they had plenty of base 10 manipulatives. That is something that the math coordinator had asked me. She said, if there are any materials you need, and I simply asked, do you have any hundred tens and ones charts, and do you have base 10 blocks? I didn't have a class set of base 10 blocks, so I wouldn't have used that. Um, as an option, but I easily could have printed out hundreds, tens, and ones charts on my own to bring, um, but she had both. So that was already ready in the classroom. Now I had about 10 to 12 minutes for my students to do this, and many of them got, you know, somewhere between three and four of these completed as they pulled the cards, built each number, and then compared them. But as always, I did want to make sure I have some sort of extension already built in. So on the bottom, it says, when you're finished, try putting all of the cards in order from smallest to largest largest and then writing them in the box. And I believe I actually had two pairs of partners that were able to start that. I think one of them even finished. So they had already pulled all their cards, done all the comparing, and then they physically worked to put the cards in order and they were writing it on the recording sheet. Now, if this were my classroom, once students were done with that activity, they would clean up on their own and grab their independent practice sheet. Here's what that sheet looked like. So students would just use their pencil to compare each number. And then down at the bottom, if they got there, they would cut out those numbers on the bottom and paste them in order from smallest to largest. I said this earlier, but that part was purposely cut out of the lesson, but I did bring a set of them for students to complete. Number one, in case you have a group of students that, you know, work together really quickly and they had tons of extra time in our 10 to 12 minutes, that didn't happen, but just in case they would have something to do so there's not, you know, dead space or dead time for them. And then also again, if the teacher wanted to complete it later, just so they could see this is exactly how I would do this lesson. Then with about three minutes left in the 30 minute lesson, I asked all my students to clean up the materials, they piled them in different places in the room, and then I had them sit at their desk for one last closing activity. I explained how well they did during their partner activity, and then I said we were going to split up into two teams, and we were each going to get a card, and we had to put ourselves in order from smallest to largest. So I had a set of green index cards and a set of yellow index cards that I passed out to every other student. And then I said, if you have a yellow index card, go back here. If you have a green index card, go up here. Uh, and then I had a timer on the board. This was the last slide that I had. It says, ready, set, go. And I had a two minute timer. And I told them, you'll have two minutes to do this, which I thought was a long period of time, but I would rather have more time than not enough. Um, for them to try to do this activity. And in fact, one of the groups, when they actually got it before the other group had even gotten there, they super quickly had put themselves in order. So we just laughed and said, I'm not even gonna press start, go ahead, everybody try to do it. And then we had the teachers just check them to make sure they were in the right order while the other team worked. And that was the closing of our lesson. So that was my full modeled lesson from the beginning all the way to the end with the slides and the printables and the lesson plan. If you happen to be teaching, comparing and ordering numbers within 120, I will link this whole thing down as a freebie for you since I already made it. If you are doing a modeled lesson, maybe this will work for you. You can totally use it if it fits, but also really make sure that you feel comfortable uh, with all the different pieces of this lesson. Again, you don't want something that's super overwhelming. So if you're not comfortable doing math talks, uh, maybe don't start with that. With the partner practice, that was definitely the most uh, hard to finagle. Again, I'd already worked in the classroom before, so I did a few different things. Number one, of course, all of your materials, you should completely have prepped. You don't have time to do anything there. Um, you're just going in and teaching. So I had enough bags with the cards already cut out and put inside them. These are all the number cards that students were gonna pull out and compare. Uh, of course, they had numbers within 120. 
Again, I knew that we had the place value mats and I knew that we had the base 10 blocks. So the only other thing I needed were partnerships. Now, I don't mind having students pick a partner, that's totally fine, but I did ask the teacher in the classroom when I got there, I asked her real quickly, number one, do they already have math partners? And she said they had, but it had been a while, so maybe we could pick new ones. And then I asked her, number two, would you like me to just pick random partners or should I say one student's name and you can tell them who that partner is going to be? And and she did that no problem at all. So I would just pick a student, she would tell them who they're paired with, they grabbed the materials, and they went. It was a fun and engaging lesson, which of course is important to me, but more important to me is that it really was reflective of how I would teach in the classroom. I said this three times already, but during your modeled lesson, you want them to really see you shine, and you want them to see what it would be like to hop into your classroom at any point in time. So for me, a math lesson always starts with a math talk, some explicit teaching by me, partner practice, independent practice, and a closing. Now, just one last thing. After the modeled lesson, I, of course, sent a thank you email, but I also took some time in that thank you email to explain a few things about the lesson. I probably went into too much detail, but I did want to explain to them that this is what a typical lesson would look like in my class with those five math components. And then I explained that it's during the partner and independent practice times that I would be pulling students back to my table who needed extra help. I also explained that if this were the first time I was teaching a skill, I would probably go around with a clipboard and just take some formative notes on how students were handling this skill, how well were they able to use their place value knowledge. That would help inform me of what students I would need to pull back in small groups during subsequent lessons. So I gave them a little insight into both my planning and how it would work in my classroom. I know this is kind of a specific video because I walked you through a very specific lesson that I taught, but I thought it would be applicable because number one, I do K through two videos and this was a pretty easy math lesson you could teach. And number two, if you are doing a model lesson anytime soon, you can still take some of the planning and prepping tips that I used to make your own lesson. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up so I know. Make sure you are subscribed to my channel and click that bell. That way you're notified of every new video. See you in the next one. Bye.